Amar, it's a great pleasure and uh, that he's come to speak to us. Aviv is uh, currently at the Technical University, having done postdoc at Berkeley University previously. And he's an expert in all kinds of things, but including AI and machine learning and uh, reinforcement learning, and applications robotics. And today's talk will be called The Interface of Reinforcement Learning and Platting. So thank you so much, Aviv, for coming to speak to us. And over to you. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Rafael, for the introduction. So I'll start, well, in our, in our lab, we're thinking about how to make robots more capable in helping us in the future in unstructured environments, like in our homes or in hospitals. And how can we design algorithms for robots that would actually allow them to, to perform some such tasks? Uh, so the talk today is going to be about sequential decision making. This is what we need for robots to perform, for example, complex tasks like navigation or manipulation or locomotion. But it's also relevant for many other scientific domains. For example, in computer systems, we apply these ideas to network routing and people have applied it to many other tasks like device placements, and in operations research, this is a resource allocation, scheduling, and so on. And usually, or at least currently, there are two main paradigms for, for solving sequential decision problems, which are either planning or reinforcement learning. You know, two of them are very popular. And the talk today is going to be on the interface or kind of combining ideas between the two. So what do I mean when I say planning? So when I say planning, I mean any method that first requires a manual model of the world and then searches with that model to figure out a plan. So take, for example, this uh, task of a peer to robot that needs to set up a dinner table. Sorry. So you can think of representing the world or the state of the robot here by the position of the different objects on the table and the different configurations of, of the robot. And now, in order to solve a task here, for example, organize it in a table, what we can do is we, we can search for a sequence of actions that uh, manipulate the problem in, into the shape we want. So, so we assume here that we know how each action that we take, for example, moving the robot's uh, joint or closing its gipper, affect the, the next state of the world. This is a strong assumption. But if we know that, we can just you know, search for other possible actions and then see whether each one of them gets us to an organized dinner table. Of course, this is a very difficult search problem, but there are algorithms that can do it very effectively. And this has been investigated in many different um, disciplines. For example, task planning, task in motion planning, optimal control. These are mature fields. We have really good algorithms, off-the-shelf algorithms. We have guarantees. We have safety guarantees. And everything works really well. The problem is that if you really want to apply these algorithms to real-world problems, which we don't have a really good model for, it becomes really difficult. So for example, we need to know the state from our observation. So how do we know if we actually hold a cup in our grip or not. That can be easy in some situations. It can be difficult if, for example, there is an occlusion or something like that. But it, that requires a pretty sophisticated for perception model. And also in many tasks, we, we never have a very good accurate dynamics model. So for example, think of uh, folding a sheet of cloth. You never have a good dynamics model for cloth or for deformable objects. So this is where you think things kind of become really complicated and the manual modeling approach you know, becomes very cumbersome. So in many other decision-making fields, the best methods we have today don't rely on manual modeling, but instead of are, are data-driven and train neural networks, deep neural networks that just map our observations directly to decisions. So for example, think of object recognition or speech recognition. The, the best methods we have today are based on deep learning. And indeed, recently, people have thought about using this approach also for decision making. And the idea here is that we can think of the policy of the robot or decision strategy as just a mapping from its observations to its actions. And we can think of replacing that with just a deep neural network 
and having the robot kind of learn automatically how to, to perform different tasks. Now the, the question is, what is the signal for learning here? What, what can we back up on? So this can be, for example, an expert that demonstrates specific tasks for us, and this is called imitation learning, or we can be even uh, uh, <clears throat> require less and just tell the robot using some reward function whenever it's done a good thing. So think of uh, training the robot to bring you coffee. If you tell it every time it brought you coffee that it did something good and ask it to get more reward this way, eventually it might learn how to do the sequence of steps that uh, give it more reward and, and bring you coffee. Now, this kind of trial and error approach may seem maybe a little bit naive, but it's also very, very beautiful. And the reason is that by training the robot just on rewards, we actually don't need to manually specify any model for the robot. We don't need to teach it what is coffee and what is important in its observations about what, uh, what's important about, about making coffee. Only thing we need to do is give it something of what it did well. And the deep neural network can actually identify any patterns in the sensory observations that are relevant for solving its tasks. So for example, if I'm making coffee, I need to know where my, my, my cup of coffee is and where my spoon is or, and so on. These are all things that the network can learn by itself, at least in principle. In practice, there are also some difficulties to, to this approach. Having a neural network, black box neural network as our controller is not very interpretable and raises some issues of safety. And more importantly, if you only train the robot on a particular task, it won't be able to generalize different tasks, which is really what we usually want when we think about robots that, that help around the house. And these methods are usually not very um, efficient in learning. They require a lot of data or a lot of time or really to think hard about how you design your reward function so that it actually works. Obviously, if you just ask it to, if you just give it a reward when you got coffee, that might never happen. So it seems that both planning and learning have some drawbacks when it gets to having robots that help us in our daily lives. But let's look at humans for a second and get some inspiration. So obviously, we learn from raw sensory input and we do some trial and error when we're learning. But we also plan, right? This is clear when, when we make once in a lifetime decisions. But we also do this every day when we try to avoid trial and error. And we also generalize. We can solve new tasks that we've never think, seen before just by thinking about the task, planning some actions, and acting accordingly. So it seems that humans kind of have the best of both worlds. And in my research, I asked the question how to design algorithms that combine ideas from planning and learning so that we have better gen generalization, better interpretability, and better efficiency. And the key idea that we're going to talk about today is how to provide some structure to the learning algorithm by involving some planning ideas or components. In particular, I'm going to talk about three main topics. The first is how or whether a neural network can actually be trained to perform planning computations. Then we'll see how we can use planning to better guide reinforcement learning. And finally, we'll talk about a neural reinforcement learning formulation that really suitable for planning, um, goal-directed planning behavior. So before I start, I'd like to give a little bit of background about reinforcement learning. So in, in RL, we think of an agent that acts in the world and tries to learn to accomplish some task. And we define this formally or mathematically using a mark of decision process. So a Markov decision process has states and actions. And there is a Markov transition probability that given the current state of the world and the action taken by the agent, it transitions to a new state as prime here. Now the agent's goal is to find some policy, which is a mapping from states to actions that is good in some sense. In what sense? Well, here we're going to talk about minimizing the sum of costs. So each state is going to be associated with some cost. And you want to take actions that minimize the expected sum of the costs over some horizon t. So the idea here is that this is a sequential decision-making problem because the agent 
needs to think about how its current actions in the beginning time steps affect later state that it can reach and obtain a reward in it. So the main idea in or underlying most of the reinforcement learning algorithms is, is something called a value function. And it's just a notion of, it's a dynamic programming idea. And the idea is that if we wanna, if, if we want to think about the minimum sum of costs that I have from a particular state of the system, it satisfies this equation called Bellman's uh, optimality equation. So think about, for example, navigation problem where you have a graph of different uh, places and you want to minimize some distance between some goal, uh, some state and, and some goal. Bellman's equation says that the shortest distance from this node to the, towards the goal is equal to the minimum over the distance to each neighbor, minimizing over all the neighbors, plus the minimum distance from that neighbor towards the goal. Basically, we want to take the best action and then proceed optimally. Now, if we can calculate this value function, this actually makes our long horizon problem be a very short horizon one, because the only thing I need to think about when I'm making a decision at a particular state is minimizing or, or taking the best action according to this equation. So in some sense, we've encapsulated all the uncertainty in the future into, into this uh, value function, and that allows us to make or solve the sequential decision making problem. All right, so this was kind of the background for reinforcement learning. Now we're gonna ask whether neural networks can actually represent finding computation. And then later we'll see whether that's even useful. So just a little bit more background. You're probably familiar with this, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about convolutional neural networks, which are the main workhorse for uh, computer vision today. Well, until transformers will, will take, uh, take a lead. So convolutional networks were originally designed for object recognition tasks. So given an image, we want to tell what is in the image, for example, a robot or a horse or a cat or something like that. And they work by repeatedly uh, feature extraction and dimensional reduction. The feature extraction works by taking some uh, filter, which is just a matrix or a mask, and applying it to each neighborhood of pixels in the image, and that produces a, uh, a new image. And then uh, we reduce the dimensionality of that by taking each uh, neighborhood of pixels and transforming them into one pixel by, for example, taking the maximum out of them. And by sequencing these uh, feature extraction and max pooling steps, we know that uh, when we train these kinds of networks on image or object recognition tasks, they kind of learn, these features learn to pick up important patterns in the image that are relevant for our task. So for example, in lower layers, they would correspond to, to edge detectors or corner detectors. And in higher layers, they would learn to pick up kind of object parts like, like eyes and particular shapes. And then in the highest levels, they actually uh, correspond to particular objects like dogs or cats or whatever you think of. Okay, so how does this uh, relate to decision making? So we said earlier that we want to have the robust decision making policy as a mapping from its observations to some actions. And this can be represented by this kind of convent. The question is how we train this convent to do whatever we want. And this we said can be done by reinforcement learning by maximizing or minimizing the sum of costs in the trajectory or by imitation learning so we have some expert data and we try to maximize the likelihood of uh, the actions that our expert take, took in our data. The thing is, this will allow us to kind of perform well in the task that we train on. But what happens when a task changes? What we need is to, to essentially replan. But it turns out that when you train things this way using these kind of components, they're not necessarily learn well to do this replanning. 
So to demonstrate that, we did a very simple experiment. We trained these cognates, which we call reactive policies here, on probably the most simple reinforcement learning problem you can think of. It's called the grid world. So here there's a map and there's an agent in red that needs to navigate to this goal position in green and uh, navigate on this grid without touching the black obstacles. And it's a very simple task. You can just you know, look at it and see what the solution is. We train a network using imitation learning to solve various randomly generated maps like this. And we asked whether the policy that it had learned would generalize to see a new map that was learned in the training set and figure out the correct trajectory. And you know, look at it, just a glance is enough to figure out that there are obstacles here and you need to go around them. But when you tried it, these reactive policies did really well on the training data, they kind of memorized it and did really bad on the test data. They didn't understand that this is actually a planning problem, that there are obstacles and you need to kind of plan how to go around them. So in order to solve that, we thought, well, maybe we need a kind of a different architecture. We want to go from our observation to some kind of model, then plan in that model, and then from that plan, output an action. If we had that, then once we change our observation, the model will change and our plan will change accordingly, and we'll probably get the correct answer. The question is how to kind of design such a model and how to train it using backpropagation, the way we know how to train these neural networks. So here we some, took some inspiration from inverse reinforcement learning or inverse optimal control. And I'll show you the solution that we came up with, which is based on value iteration. So I'll describe a particular planning algorithm and I'll show how we can combine it with a particular neural network. So remember that value function that we had seen previously, where we said that the value is equivalent to the minimum over the current distance to a particular neighbor and the shortest distance from that neighbor to the goal. Well, that can also be used to devise an, al a, an algorithm for computing this value function, which goes like this. You, you start with some random values and you repeatedly update the value by updating it, uh, by taking the minimum of your current cost to a neighbor, plus what you currently estimate is that distance from that neighbor to the goal. And if you repeat that, you're guaranteed to converge to the true value function. This is called value iteration. Now, if you have stochastic transitions, well, the only thing that changes is your transition probability, you can just take an expectation over that. Now, when we look at that, we, at least for this grid world, we saw that this actually is very similar to the architecture that we had in a convolutional neural network. Specifically, we repeatedly apply linear operations and max pooling. Let me make it even more precise. So think about this uh, value iteration on a grid world. You can think of it as having one image that represents my current value, another that represents my current cost. Then we do a convolution over those, which represents this transition probabilities. And then for each action, we get a new kind of channel in our image. And then we minimize for each pixel over these channels. And then we get a new value function estimate. This is the next value in value iteration algorithm. And then we just plug that right in instead of our current value and repeat. So in, in principle, value iteration can be represented as a particular type of recurrent convolutional neural network where we share the weights in the convolution that correspond to these expectations. So this is very clean in the grid world setting, but it's actually much more general because value iteration is applies a linear computation and then, then a minimization. And these are the same computations that are used in a convent and we know that we can backprop through them. So that means that we can backprop through value iteration as well. So with this understanding that value iteration planning is equivalent to a particular type of convent, we went on to design what we call a value iteration network. So value iteration network or VIN takes as input our observation, for example, the, the map of the speed world maps it using some regular neural network components to a reward or cost map, and then sends it to this value iteration component that will output a value function. And then from this value function, we're gonna use another standard neural network component to map that into an action. The point here is that once we're training a value iteration network, what we're actually asking is what is the planning computation 
such that the optimal plan in this, in, in our model, or what is the model that, such that the optimal plan in our model produced the action that we saw in our data. So we expected that this would generalize better to, to novel maps and because we understand or the network has the capability to understand the underlying model and, and do a planning computation on that. And indeed, this is what we show here. So we tested that on both small and medium and large maps. And on small maps, all the algorithms or all the networks that we tried, including these reactive baselines did well, because you can kind of memorize all the possible maps. But once you increase the map size, memorization is not a very good strategy. And then the planning of bi direction networks is much, much, much better. We can also visualize what the network had learned here. So we can take in, uh, fit it an input map and see what it thinks are the rewards that corresponds to this map. And here it chose to place a high reward on the goal and negative reward on the obstacles and small negative reward on um, all the free space. And if you try to maximize this, what you would get is a short path leading to the goal around the obstacles. Now, I want to emphasize, we never told it that this is a reward that's suitable for this task. We just showed it what good trajectories, good solutions look like. And it learned that a model and a reward function that explains this data is exactly what we saw here. So since we worked on, on this, there have been many follow-ups uh, by, by many different research groups that applied value duration networks as components in much more sophisticated uh, networks. For example, Gupta et al. use it for first person navigation and Kai et al. use it for uh, autonomous self-driving self in a crowd. And you can also think about this uh, idea in a much more general way as having a policy that is actually a differentiable planner. So you take a planning computation that we know that is differentiable and we use that as some part of a neural network. And we expect that this would work well for a particular task. So for example, uh, we extended this idea for robotic manipulation using a linear quadratic regulator planning algorithm. And uh, there have been many other works that apply this for other planning algorithms, for example, forward search on a graph and uni universal uh, planning networks. Okay, so now we understand that neural networks have a fundamental capability to perform planning computations, at least if they are architected appropriately. And now we can ask how we can actually use that for different applications. So I'll show some applications about how we can use neural networks to speed up planning computations. And the idea is as follows. Think of this uh, robot that needs to navigate a warehouse. Probably every day it will have different tasks or different places it needs to go to in the warehouse, but most of the warehouse will probably remain the same. So if we just approach this by regular planning uh, approach where we just plan from scratch every time, we won't exploit any knowledge that we may gain by, by or exploiting that the fact that most of the time the plans are similar. So we want to do this, we want to exploit that, and the way we, we think about this is we want to train offline on many solved instances of planning problems. This might take a very long time, but hopefully we'll learn something that will help us train or solve a new problem online much, much faster. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to take or you think about standard planning algorithms, they map from some specification of a problem to a plan and then actions, we're going to replace all that by some deep neural network that just looks at the problem and outputs actions. And this might seem like a, a terrible thing to do because we are not using specific planning algorithms, but we'll see that we can actually use, even if whatever we learn here is a heuristic to, to plug into standard planning algorithms to make them work much faster. So first let me just convince you that this actually can work well. So here are two different domains. On the right one is a motion planning problem. And here the robot, it's a continuous planning problem. The robot needs to uh, plan its motion from the green 
the, for the n effector for each from the green point to the yellow point between these obstacles. And you see that it can plan really non-trivial trajectories. And this is just a neural network that was trained to output what is the next step in the plan. And on the left here, this is a game called Sokoban. Here it is this red agent needs to move the purple objects to the green goal positions, but it can only do this by pushing them, which requires non-trivial trajectories because if, for example, you push them into a corner, then they get stuck because you can pull them out. So you see that this is just a neural network that was trained using imitation learning. And you see that it, at least it looks like it's doing long horizon plans that are quite sophisticated. So you should ask how well this works. And one way we can measure it is, well, we can give you numbers. So we train this on 9,000 different maps in the Sokoban uh, problem. And then we test on maps that are not in the training data. And we found that, well, with one object, we solve 97% of them. And with two objects, which is slightly harder, we solve 87%. And uh, well, what does that mean? Um, maybe a better way to look at it is say, well, if we learned how good plans look like, we should be able to use that knowledge to plan better. So we can, if we, if we can flag it as a heuristic in a standard planning algorithm, we'll get a 100% success rate if the planner is complete. But then we can ask whether this actually helps the plan, uh, plan faster. Plan plan. So we did that. And here, this graph shows, um, the, the x-axis shows the plan length. This is the uh, quality of the plan. And the uh, y-axis shows the number of states explored. This is proportional to the speed or uh, of the plan. And you want to reduce, you want to explore less states. That means that you have much more structural knowledge about what good plans look like. So for example, if you look at the LAMA planner, which is a, a state of the art optimal planner that we use here, it, uh, it produces the shortest plans by definition, but it also takes a really long time. This is log scale here. If you use A star with our neural network heuristic, on the other hand, it's almost as good as Lama, but several, order, uh, several orders of magnitude faster. So this really shows that our neural network was able to capture relevant um, structures of how good plans look like. All right, to summarize this part of the talk, by coming up with specific architectures for neural networks, we're able to design or inject some inductive bias into the neural network that is specific for solving planning problems. And we saw how this could lead to better planning when combined uh, in certain planning algorithms. So we've seen how learning can improve planning. Now we're going to ask the next part, kind of the opposite question. Can we use planning to improve learning? So this project is a, was a collaboration with Siemens, and the motivation was automated assembly. So if there's a, something called Industry 4.0, which talks about automated manufacturing. And uh, you can think of uh, uh, delivering projects or customizable projects to, to users by uh, having like 3D printers that print the products and then having automatic robots that assemble the objects and then uh, deliver them to, to uh, the customers. And currently, a major bottleneck in this idea is the assembly of different products. And the reason is that assembly is a tough control problem and typically requires a lot of human uh, effort, engineering effort, and is a bottleneck. And we wanted to see if we can use learning algorithms to design robotic controls that can automatically assemble products. So one thing that we have in our advantage in automatic assembly is that we know that part that we want to assemble. Typically, we have uh, CAD models or geometric information about that. So we can use that to plan. In particular, we can use motion planning, off-the-shelf motion planning, to plan in advance how the trajectories for assembly will look like. But then we actually need to execute these trajectories. 
And it's going to be difficult because usually ass assembly requires tight fitting components that we need to insert into one another. That means frictions and contacts, which are very hard to model. And slight pose estimation errors can lead to very bad outcomes. So let me give you an example of this. Here's a classic assembly problem, which calls a peg insertion. So let's say we want to fit this uh, blue peg into this green hole. And I think, assume that we think that the hole is located in the green position, but actually it's located in the red position. So what would you do here? So a standard controller will tell you, okay, in this position, you need to press downwards on it. But applying a force in that direction, we actually get the piece stuck and you won't be able to recover from that. What you want to do is kind of wiggle it around until you find the hole and then slightly insert it. But that requires a much more complex controller that really requires some manual modeling uh, most of the time. We wanted to learn that automatically. So just to say that this really is a problem in practice, we, we ran uh, such a controller, off-the-shelf controller from Move It package on these tight-fitting assembly problems, and they fail exactly at that contact point. That's what I did. So an alternative is to go reinforcement learning on the problem and say, okay, I don't want to tell the algorithm anything, just give it some reward when it assembles the objects correctly. In principle, that could work, but in practice, most challenging, uh, for most challenging application, it would never work. Because think about uh, learning to fit, for example, this ring on a peg. And if the reward that I give it is proportional to the distance to the goal position, well, it will never find out by random trial and error that it actually needs to get away from the goal and then place it on the peg and then slide it back down to get closer. Instead of just you know, moving it to the side of the peg, that's going to be a pretty good local uh, optimum for the cost. And we'll never figure out that there is something else that we want to do. So here's what happens when you try a state of the art reinforcement learning algorithm on this problem. And well, at least according to the RL algorithm, it's currently doing optimally. It maximizes its reward. It's doing exactly what we wanted it to. Obviously, this is not what we want. All right, so we kind of wanted to mix these two approaches and we came up with something, a very simple idea. We're gonna use the motion plan that we computed by planning as a reference trajectory for the reinforcement learning algorithm to track. So we, our cost function is gonna be a sum of, over the distances from our current state to the reference trajectory that we computed. And the point here is that this sum of cost allows the policy to kind of slightly deviate from the plan so long as this deviation helps it get closer to the plan in later time steps. So for example, think about this uh, uh, contact point. Even if you don't follow the plan directly, accurately, we might deviate so, so that further along the plan we'll be able to track it more precisely. So we designed a system where the robot first identifies the objects in the scene and then estimates their pose using standard tools and then uses the off-the-shelf motion, motion planning algorithms to calculate a trajectory to some goal. And then we fit this trajectory to our reinforcement learning. Here's a policy search algorithm. And here's some examples of what our method can do. These are all very tight fitting assembly problems, less than one millimeter tolerance between the parts. And this is done on a PR2 robot, which is not the most accurate robot that you can, you can buy, you could buy. And it's, there are no force torque sensors on this robot. So we don't use any force torque sensing. This means that the robot needs to figure out by itself in which areas of the safe space you need to kind of apply flexible motion or compliant motion, which you see here, for example, when, if you show this video again, you see that it learned from a compliant soft motion once this gear is on the shaft, because this is the only way it can get it to slide without bumping and getting stuck on the wall. This was learned from the reinforcement learning aid algorithm that needed to track the plan. It's actually quite quick learning because we have a lot of prior knowledge here from the motion plan and requires about 30 minutes of interaction time with the robot. So it's actually practical to, lear uh, to learn uh, in, in uh, for real assembly problems. 
we compared our approach to uh, two very relevant baselines. The first is just using the reinforcement learning here, it's called ILTG, without the motion plan, and only using the motion planning with a standard controller and not reinforcement learning. And both baselines really failed. The only point where reinforcement learning was able to, to solve a task is there was a very easy peg insertion task where we started with the peg right above the hole. That really didn't require any complex exploration, but our method was able to solve all of these tasks very successfully. The, the main conclusion here is that, well, if you have some prior knowledge, definitely use it. It really helps with learning algorithms. And geometric knowledge, at least for robotics, is a very strong form of knowledge that we can really exploit in reinforcement learning solutions. All right, so, so we've seen how we can use or combine reinforcement learning for solving uh, planning problems and, and, and vice versa. And so far we've looked at, we used standard reinforcement learning algorithms. And as we thought about the, this problem more and more about how to use reinforcement learning for planning, we figured out that the standard RL formulation doesn't really take advantage of the structure of most planning problems. And what I wanna tell you about now is a new work that we call sad goal trees, which is a new formulation of reinforcement learning that's more suitable for this. So the thing is that the typical uh, way we think about planning problems is that we have multiple goals that we want our planner to produce plans for. And we want, so, so standard planning algorithms are very capable of that. They're not limited by the number of goals or particular goals that you have, you just fit in a goal and they find a plan. But we want to replace this planner with a neural network. So we want, uh, we want to make sure that this still works. But the problem is that reinforcement learning has kind of a single goal formulation. So we have a particular and single cost function and cost function can, for example, represent the goal. So how can we um, solve this problem where we have one cost function for RL, but we want to solve multiple goals uh, for the planning problem? Well, the way we did it until now, which is what I presented before, is very simple. We just added the goal to our state observation. And now the cost function can depend on the goal. For example, it can represent the distance to this particular uh, green uh, location here. And then we can train it using standard reinforcement learning algorithms. But the question is whether, is this the optimal thing we can think about? So let me motivate why I don't think that this is the case. So let's consider deterministic problems. We call this a navigation problem on a map. And if you think about deterministic problems, then the body iteration algorithm is equivalent to algorithm for a shortest path on a graph called the Belmont Ford algorithm, which is a single goal shortest path algorithm, which calculates the shortest distance from any particular node in the graph towards the goal. And it has a worst case running time of n cubed, where n is the number of nodes in this graph. Now, what we did in our kind of trick before is to add the goal as a particular, another state in this, uh, in this graph. And now we apply Belmont Ford algorithm to kind of reach every possible goal. And this is the approach that was taken by us and many other uh, um, works in this field, like hindsight experience to play and universal value function approximation. But the point here is that if you think about the, the shortest path on a graph formulation, this naive approach for the, now we want all pairs shortest path, because we want to reach from every state to every particular goal. This would, in worst case, require n to the power of four computation complexity. But we know that we can do much better, at least for deterministic problems. There are algorithms for auto shortest path. For example, Floyd Warshall can solve the problem in n cubed iterations. 
So there, that means that there is some structure in the multi-goal setting that when we are treating it naively as we did before, we're actually missing out on. So what we wanted is to reformulate reinforcement learning, not based on the Bellman equation that we saw earlier, but on a different first principle, which is more similar to the all pair shortest path problem. And hopefully this will allow us a different RL formulation that's suitable for multiple goals. And we should hope that we can uh, prove that it's better and, and make it work with different or compl on complex problems. So let me describe it in a little bit more detail. So we're considering the all pairs shortest path problem on a graph. So we have a directed a graph where the weight, the costs are the weights on, uh, on, on the edges. We're going to assume that we have n nodes and all the weights are non negative. And we assume that uh, the cost from each node to itself is zero and the graph is fully connected. That means that if we have unconnected edges, we're just going to assume that they have infinite or a very large weight. Yeah, that's, that's it. What we want is that for any two nodes in this graph, we want to find the shortest trajectory between them, a trajectory that minimizes the sum of cost along the way. So we are going to uh, define a dynamic programming principle for the all pair shortest path problem that is going to be compatible with function approximation in neural networks and reinforcement learning. And this is based on an idea that we call a sub goal tree. So what is a sub goal tree? So think about how we compute a trajectory in the standard Bellman approach. What we ask every time is what is the next state in our, in our plan? So what is the next given start? What is the next node that I'm reaching? And then what is the next node and so on? In a, and this is the way we build a complete trajectory. In a sub tree, we're gonna ask something different. We'll ask what is the middle state between S and G? That's gonna give us something. And then that separates the, the problem into two. And we're gonna ask what is the middle state between the start and the sub goal that I just found. And then what is the middle state between the sub goal and the goal that's gonna give us two more sub goals. And then we can break it up into four different problems and so on and repeat that until we build the whole trajectory. Why is this a good idea? Well, first of all, let me show you that it's a, that it actually computes the shortest path. So we're gonna define the value of a state and a goal as prime, as a, a, sub k, v sub k, as the length of the shortest path between them in two to the power of k steps or less. And this value function has a, a very intuitive dynamic programming idea, which is written here. So you can think of the shortest distance in say 16 steps or less as composed as to sure as the shortest distance to a sub goal that is eight steps or less from the start plus another trajectory that is eight steps or less from this sub goal towards the goal. And this is what this equation here shows. So we can de decompose the problem or develop it in this way. And we show that for K greater than log N, the value function to get has the shortest uh, path from every state to every uh, goal. Now, how many, what, what is the complexity of running this algorithm? So, each iteration, we need to go over all our states and over all our next states and minimizes over all the possible sub goals. So that's n cubed, but we only run this for log n steps. So it's n cubed log n. So this is still better than n to the power four that we had for the standard Bellman equation. So this shows that we're actually exploiting some structure here. Now, what happens when you introduce approximations? This is what we want to uh, look at when we have some neural networks. So how do these subtle trees handle approximation? Well, we're, we're going to do this mathematically by defining the dynamic programming operator or equation as an operator T. And we're going to ask, given that once we apply this operator, we have some error epsilon, how does this occur error propagate in our value function? So once we do this for the first iteration, Every, uh, every trajectory of length one is gonna have an error epsilon. Then we're gonna combine these errors 
So on the next time uh, iteration, we're going to have an error of two epsilon, and then four epsilon, and so on. And then at the end, the error over the whole trajectory is going to be at most n time epsilon. It's actually similar to what happened in a Bellman equation, because in the Bellman equation, we have an error for the first time step, and then another epsilon for the second time step, and so on. And once we sum it up, we have n epsilon. So it looks similar. But this is not the point. The point is, after you compute this value function, how you use it. So you use it to actually figure out what is the trajectory that you want to run. So once you make decisions based on this value function, some of these are much better. Because in the first decision that we're making, we're going to ask, what is the first sub goal? That's going to be give us an n epsilon error. But then for these two sub goals, we're going to get n over 2 error, and then n over 4, and so on. And once you sum these up, you get n log n. Compared to the standard Bellman equation approach, where in the first time step you have n epsilon, then n minus 1 epsilon, and n minus 2, and so on, when you sum up these errors, you get n squared. This means that the subgold tree approach is inherently better at, at, at working with approximations. And what this comes down to is that the trajectories that we have have less drift. Here are some examples. Now, so we can then uh, use these ideas to come up with reinforcement learning algorithms based on subgroup trees. And this is, for example, a simple uh, maze navigation. What's interesting here is to see these value functions. So these value functions represent the shortest distance within two to the power of k steps or less. And the goal here is on the top right. So with one step, you can only reach it from very short uh, neighborhood. Uh, everything that's yellow is unreachable. And then once you increase k, you increase the reachability. And eventually, for k equals 6, you can reach it from everywhere on this uh, world. And great, and the value function is a smooth increasing, uh, sorry, uh, decreasing function of uh, the distance of the goal. When we compare it to the standard reinforcement algorithms, we saw that it performs much, much better. I want to kind of take us back to what we wanted to do in the first place. We wanted to see that this solves multiple goal problems that are high dimensional and non-trivial. So apply it to this robot motion planning problem, where you need to move this robot from different configurations to other configurations. And there's also a wall that you don't want to hit. And here's some uh, results. So here's an example trajectory that starts here and wants to get here. So the first sub goal that it found is this one. And then it found two other sub goals in between. And the way this works is, well, it only does a linear motion between the sub goals. But you see that this linear motion actually solves the task without hitting the wall. And this reaches the goal position. And the idea is there's a neural network that maps from the robot's position to these particular sub goals. And this neural network learn what are good sub goals for this task. And here's some more demonstrations on different types of sub goals. So the point here is that this neural network takes its input, a state, and a goal, and it can calculate the sub goals for each state and each different goal. All right, to, to conclude, we came up with a new reinforcement learning principle or framework where the first principle is the all first shortest path. And we believe that this is a much more appropriate formulation for learning planning problems. We proved that it's actually more efficient in multiple goal settings, both without approximation and with approximation. And it's a basis for many new algorithm, algorithms. I'll show you some results. We're also working on many, many different algorithms along these designs. And there are many questions that are left to address here. For example, how to handle stochasticity, how to do exploration, and how to handle high dimensional observations like images. These are all things that are left to future work. All right. So uh, with this, I want to conclude my talk. I want to th thank all the collaborators that made all this work possible. And thank you for listening.
So we need to clap virtually. So thank you very much, Aviv. Imagine us all clapping. Uh, are there any questions? I guess you put them into, well, you can just ask them actually out loud or put them in chat at this point. So what I wanted to say was that, I mean, as someone who doesn't work directly in this area, it looks like the future, what, what you present here. I'd say it really does look uh, absolutely fantastic. And um, I, I loved all, a number of your examples are really, really quite extraordinary. So I see you've collaborated a lot with industry. Have you found that collaboration to be easy? Have they been directly receptive of your methods or they've been suspicious of academia? How has that worked? Well, I, I've collaborated with industry in, in several ways. So one is in kind of research, which is what I, I showed here. And I think when you collaborate for research, it's very easy to, you know, to push for uh, difficult problems and methods that are not necessarily uh, the most, um, say, uh, this is not something that they have to adopt at the end, only if it's uh, if they want to. But I also collaborated on you know, specific projects, uh, advising and things like that. And I think uh, the learning methods are not the first choice, at least not currently, because there is a lot of overhead and, and these methods are not as robust as a model-based planning for most of the problems that people solve today, so if I think about, for example, uh, self-driving cars, it's not clear that we want uh, to rely to solve the, the difficult planning problems there only using deep neural networks because there are several problems. One is the safety component. So even if I had a really good neural network that in all my test cases did phenomenally, I don't understand how it works. So I don't know in advance whether if there is some you know something that I didn't think about that's going to be disastrous in the real world. So that's one kind of a, a difficulty. That's when you're writing papers, it, it's less of an issue. But once you actually want to deploy a product, it is something that you need to think about. So people are looking into you know adding more safety layers and um, and things like that, uh, or some some uh, security. But another thing is when you're developing a product, it's not only the performance of the method that you, that's important, but also the, how easy it is to develop, how easy it is to debug and, uh, and, and to maintain. And I think that there, there is a really large gap between reinforcement learning and learning based approaches in, in, in general and what you can do with classical or standard approaches. So, um, these things are hard to debug. So when something doesn't work, it's not really clear what are the steps that you would take to solve your problem. And as a development pipeline, that can be very problematic. And okay. this is one this is one direction that many people are looking into. And I think it's starting to gain more momentum in, in research. And that must happen before people actually adopt these strategies in a more kind of wide sense. So I guess they both both kind of relate to explainability. I mean, uh, debugging as well the same. And so, I mean, there are a number of approaches for explainability, I, I understand, which people are developing. Do you have any ideas which one might be prom most promising for your work? Um, I think that if you learn, uh, so, so, so if, at least for robotics, I think that most of the problems here we can visualize, we can imagine good visualization tools that will help us understand what is supposed to happen. So if I could predict, or if the robot would tell me that what it predicts will happen in the future after it took an action, and I look at that and it doesn't seem reasonable to me, then I can stop it. But if it looks well, then I can say that, well, at least it looks uh, reasonable. So compared to other problems where, for example, porting folding or something like that, where you, it's maybe more difficult to, to um, think about good visualizations, here I think it's really clear. And we have works along that line. I didn't show it right now, but we have works where the robot learns to imagine the effects of its particular actions and produce an image of that. And that can help you visualize if the model that it has is actually good or not. And actually when, when we did that, we were able to um, rule out many, many different models that were not good just by inspection before actually running them on a robot. 
So I think that's one one uh, research direction that's promising. There's a lot more to do. I mean, these are really, really uh, preliminary steps along these uh, ways. Well, thank you. I should say before, before, I, before I finish it, I did, I, I found the video of when, when the, um, the sort of wheel is moved along to the peg and it touches the peg before it goes up in order to try and drop down into it. That was very, very attractive, I have to say, because you can imagine exactly that's what a blind person would do. And the real world is in some sense blind. And um, I thought that was, that was particularly attractive, I have to say. If you remember, it sort of bangs into the side a bit and then goes up and goes back down again. The robot was really blind because yeah. it had an input the joint uh, measurements. So it didn't have any camera input. Either. Right, yeah. So that was very attractive. So unless there are questions from the crowd, I will just, uh, again, imagine us all applauding. Thank you so much. It was really, really great you could come and talk to us. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure and wish you all the best. I'll say goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.